got this to talk about here courtesy of how long gone it's a bit of a long clip to play here but it features a guy called del water gap on episode number 547 of how long gone and he's basically talking about something that i think about a lot when it comes to creativity and working within the arts because unfortunately working within this industry or this space that i'm currently occupying in which means you know anything from design from podcasting to djing to content creation it is really an unpredictable and um a random space to be in there is no one path to success you don't have to go to school to do this you don't have to do a particular type of thing to get successful it just happens or it doesn't but because of that unpredictability and uncertainty people can sometimes hold on to that dream far longer than they need to and maybe there is a real strength in being able to accept that hey even though it's happened for loads of other people who are maybe far dumber than i am it just hasn't happened for me for whatever reason and i'm going to be grown enough to accept that's the case and move on to other things but it can be really hard to do so because unfortunately in this fucking world of the arts and creative stuff in the scene and shit sometimes at the point of you giving up it's right at the point that you get a breakthrough so what do you do do you keep holding on to your dream do you still try to become that rapper when you're fucking 35 or 45 or 55 years old or do you give up what is actually the strength what is actually the real thing to do and i think del water gap on here speaks about it really clearly on how long on episode number five or seven it's a bit of a long clip i'm going to play in full so you can get a context of what you're speaking about so my first show back out of covid was actually at red rocks which was crazy i never thought i'd play a show again oh, you know, i went into covid i had a big career reassessment in covid as we all did you know as many of us did i was yeah we we jason and i both did we started a podcast oh, yeah. so we really there had a career go. reassessment <laughs> yeah real reassessment but yeah no i mean i i a, a couple months in the pandemic i started calling friends and being like you know i think it's time for my next move you know I, music was not happening for me and i had been through a couple really unfortunate record deal situation you mean like the music wasn't coming to you or the it wasn't oh no it was career-wise it was the business career-wise i mean you know i yeah i have been at daughter gap for for a minute i started it when i went to college and um i had made a lot of records that i was really proud of but um yeah it just wasn't affording me the life that i wanted you know i, I was just sure. struggling all the time so i was like you know tell me <laughs> my next move and then of course as soon as i started looking elsewhere the the music career stuff started lifting as it does you know oh so you're saying you were gonna you were gonna go you were gonna finally chase your dreams of being a barista type vibe dude or? I, I was i was fully looking into becoming a cpa what fully. cpa what? yeah dude yeah <laughs> did your grandmother suggest this yeah who suggested no, my parents this? actually my parents sat me down and they had a like a printed brochure and they said <laughs> wait they, they said you know you seem really unhappy you know, we, we would pay for you to become a CPA if that's something you'd want to do. And I think I was like mentally ill enough at the time. <laughs> you know, I, was like, I was like, just like, you know what? Fuck it. I was like, I probably the only guy that's ever said fuck it in the same sentence as CPA, but I did. And I said, fuck it. I'm going to be a CPA. Wow. When I look at it in retrospect, I was still looking at it through my poetic New York indie boy lens, which was this sort of einsteinian <laughs> fantasy right of i like this go on you you twisted you twisted you were like i'm gonna be the first hot cpa yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna, figure I'm gonna this be out. super mysterious i'm gonna sit in the corner i'm gonna be scheming the whole time i'm writing my book they don't know okay but i'm writing my book you'd had a full fantasy created you were ready to rock <laughs> oh yeah i didn't know it but you know i need I was my like, account I can... to be really scheming you know what <laughs> exactly. i mean <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what i'm looking for it's like i could <laughs> deliver this to a publicist and they would slam it out of the park you know yeah i love i love i love the <laughs> idea know, of you sitting the and like where i was at was i had called a few friends and i had been like yo I've been really unhappy for a while and it was not a mystery to anyone. I had sure. made some records that I fucking loved. I still love. I mean, this record, Don't Get Dark, I put it out on this cool indie label and, you know, it got to people, more people in retrospect than I realized, but it, it you know, I was working like four jobs. I was catering. I was setting up photo booths, you know, fancy 4,000 a party photo booths and making sure people didn't break them. And I was doing tech support for old ladies. I was yeah. literally Photoshopping for my grandma's friends and setting up their Wi-Fi. And um, <laughs> such a nice boy, you know? Yeah, damn, this is so sick. And then I would, and then I would rent this studio 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. from this guy, Justin Garish, um, who's a great mixer. And he, yeah, so I had the studio overnight. So I'd go in at 6 p.m. and work all night, basically, and sleep during the day and then go to a job. And it was just not good for my mental health. And then amidst that, I was drinking a lot and I 
had a little bit of a benzo problem, which definitely did not help. And mm. I was watching Breaking Bad. Yeah, so that was the vibe. And then COVID started and I had this wonderful opportunity to check in with myself and and got got sober. And then this career stuff started happening online. I had one foot out the door. And then one thing after another, uh, my my new manager called me and said, hey, you you have this opportunity to open for someone at Red Rocks. So my first show back after the pandemic was playing for 7,000 people at Red Rocks. And it was my first sober show. And it was the first time I ever cried on stage. And it was a version of maybe something you felt, Chris, where like, you know, being being sober gave me the ability to turn the knob up on some of my emotions. Like I felt emotional in a way again, like moved in a way again that I hadn't in a while. I'm dead you know? inside. So, and I would agree with you. Yeah, that that is that's that's absolutely yeah. true because you just don't have anywhere to hide. What exactly made you cry when you were playing at Red Rocks? Just overwhelmed in general? Or was there like a specific moment or a song that made you made you crack? That's a good question. I'm. It was a combination of things. I think the overwhelming feeling was just that I had literally decided that I was never going to play a show again. I was done playing music and I was okay with it and I had accepted it. Mm -hmm. It was like it was like seeing a loved one come back from the dead. It was a version of that for me. You know, music had been my whole life. It had been the only thing that I really cared about, you know, it, even to a detriment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really sacrificed friendships and romantic relationships to 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 become a great artist and to become a great writer and to become a great producer. And I had really come to terms with the fact of kissing that part of my identity, my life goodbye. And I think standing on stage at that particular venue, which I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's, you know, it's like a cathedral. It's one of the what an amazing, 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 amazing story that he shared there. It's something that I feel like a lot of people can definitely, 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 definitely 120% recognize and sympathize with because it's an unfortunate state because unfortunately there is no clear path to anything or these type of things. You kind of have to just figure it out along the way somewhere. But usually I think maybe there is something to be said for letting go and then for it to be suddenly landing back in your feet again or in your lap. There is definitely, definitely something in it. And maybe the strength of letting go, the strength of being okay with kissing your dreams goodbye and then maybe getting back to some level of reality. The fact that you went to be a CPA of all things after being a career musician is absolutely insane. I don't think that's probably the right way to go about things. Maybe, maybe in my opinion, I would think, especially if you're that late in your career and you haven't made it yet, maybe doing a switch and doing just something super monotonous, super monotonous, monotonous sorry, and also something something repetitive and something that just doesn't require much brain power is maybe a better way to go about it if you want to do a regular job than maybe going and working in finance and stuff because that contrast is probably going to end up driving you crazy one moment you're on tour with your friends and stuff in a tiny van playing in clubs drinking all night and now suddenly you're in a cubicle do you know what I mean that kind of reality is probably a little bit too harsh but there probably is some strength and some utility in the idea of letting go and having coming being at peace with the fact that you know you can't have your dream right now and maybe trying to focus on something else and then hoping maybe along the lines that things can change change sometime when you have that other thing but you're not putting all your eggs in one basket you're not putting too much pressure on the thing that you're doing anymore and you've kind of just accepted where you're at but again how do you tell someone someone like something like that how do you even come to terms of it yourself you know what I mean? Is it loser mentality to have that kind of idea about yourself? I don't really know. But I've definitely seen um, those things happen to myself. I've seen it happen to other people. And it's a really hard thing to kind of get your head around. But I think for the most part, if you have friends or whatever who are trying to you know, pursue an art, a career in the arts or entertainment industry and stuff, that's very hard to, you know, to figure out and they're in their old age or things are happening for them, don't tell them to quit. They probably know they should at some point if you don't want to offer words of encouragement because you don't think their work is good you don't want to lie fair enough but just be a supporting hand if you can whatever way they go just try to support them in any way shape or form that you can support them but trying to you know make them snap out of it and come back to reality isn't the way forward because i think most people who, unless there's a super small delusional small amount but the most people out there we know we know when we're being delusional we know that we should probably go and figure some stuff out and get a regular job you're just hoping it kind of turns around for you and sometimes this kind of you know fairy tale story happens and you know just as a time that you're about to quit and take on this freaking cpa job which is interesting too because you know his parents are the ones that offered him the money um to go and do this cpa course which says everything you want about the arts right you can afford to take chances and live on the edge because you've 
you've got this, you know, you've got this sort of safety net with your parents and they can also save you when you decide to do a career move, but most people can't, but hey, you know, sorry for another day. But I think that kind of fairy tale story of, oh, I was about to quit and then suddenly I got this big, you know, gig to play in front of these thousands of people and then that led to other things, that is not everybody's story. I understand it isn't the case, but it's good to know that we all kind of have these same sort of ruminations going through our head. Um, but I do like this bit of the story where he says, oh, I went to take this accounting job and my idea was to be like the coolest accounting, uh, the coolest accountant or CPA ever. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to have a Tom Brown suit on. I'm going to be doing kind of finance podcasts, like done the cool way and shit. It's like, dude, it doesn't, it, it's not like that. You know what I mean? Some jobs are just jobs. You can't turn everything into a, an attempt to, you know, recreating the scene. And usually I feel like sometimes having the contrast of having a really boring job and then going back to doing your creative thing can sometimes be quite beneficial to the work that you end up producing in the first place anyway. So it just depends on what kind of attitude you want to take with these sort of things. But either way, I thought that was a good thing to kind of ruminate on for you, those of you out there who are still chasing it and still hustling. And hopefully that brought you some level of motivation in the stuff that you're doing.